super producer, Mark Batson. Now you're talking. <laughs> Congratulations on the release, sir. Thank you, man. It was, uh, it was so much good energy that went into it. And uh, I'm glad I'm getting a lot of great response and uh, I'm, I'm happy about that. And I thank you, man, as well, man, for um, giving me so much energy and, and, and being one of my first three listeners uh, uh, to, uh, to vibe to it in the demos. Man, that was an honor for me, man. It, it uh, carried me up many uh, hikes at Griffith Park. It uh, kept nice. me balanced in many of uh, traumatic, energetic moments during 2020. Uh, I think your timing is great. Thank you, man. Thank you. I, 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 I really appreciate that, man. Uh, I'm just getting a lot of great response. So uh, it, it's, it, it seems to be achieving the goal. I, I just created it, you know, to boost myself. And then I was like, well, maybe one other person might want to feel this. And then that's just catching on, you know. So I'm getting good vibes from artists and athletes as well. Uh, uh, Barry Tito, uh, who pitched for the San Francisco Giants, he reached out to me yesterday to tell me how much he was pumped up on it. And just a lot of good vibes, man. I talked to Tank, Tank from Tank and the Bangers reached out this morning. Okay. So it was like, it's, I needed this so bad, you know, and I, and I love it. So I'm just getting some good vibes and reception on it. I'm real happy about that. That's great to hear, man. That's really awesome. So take me through the process of, um, it sounded like it was organic. It sounds like you were just making things for yourself and then you looked up, you're like, yo, this needs to be out there. Right. That's, that's exactly what happened. Um, it, it all started, you know, you know, starting with the pandemic because, you know, when the pandemic first came, uh, we were first told that it was something that was, you know, only going to be in China and only for elderly people in China. Uh, um, and so but when you, when we hear about these things, I know for myself, naturally, you know, as black Americans, we brace up because, you know, we've been through so much here and we always know when things like this happen or things like this come out in the world that we, we often are affected more than everybody else. So I was kind of braced up for it. And then, um, then there was this whole uh, dialogue and conversation that black people can't get the coronavirus. I don't know if you remember that one. But early on, I was they were like, I was cool with Corona like, with, at that I point. Was, ah, finally, you know, so we, we got one, you know, then there was like nobody in Africa has it at all. And uh, so that was that kind of sentiment. And then, boom, you know, one day the bomb came and I remember it was on television and it was, you know, it was the president with Fauci and uh, they went on television to change the dialogue to say, now this is serious. This is a problem. And we just letting everybody you know that African Americans are going to be more likely to die from it from any, than anybody else. And at that point, um, you know, you get this feeling of like, what can you do about this? It's an invisible monster. You know, you can't, it's not like you could go out in the street and start beating the coronavirus up with a bat. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's an invisible monster. You know, you, you can't do anything. You know, you kind of powerless. It's like, you know, you know stay home and hide from it. And uh, at that point, um, I think in my resistance to, to that feeling, uh, I went into, started to write lyrics because, um, you know, at that point before when I listen to, mostly when I work out or I do my treadmill runs in the morning, I'm listening to like Wu-Tang, 50. That's where I get my energy from. But at that point, I didn't really feel the same energy from that, you know what I'm saying? Because it's real aggressive, you know, the, the music is real aggressive towards other black people, you know? Um, um, and that's, you know, that's not wrong with that because that's how gangster movies are made. They're made from within the culture. So, so, uh, you know, you, you, I got, got the, you know, I couldn't really feel that vibe. So I was like, I need to write something specifically just for me for this. And then I started writing the lyrics to I am where I'm like, there's no energy that could beat me, defeat me, sit me down or hold me back. All attacks are like Neo when he waved them bullets, you know, that, that point I'm saying, I reject this. I'm gonna survive this. And that was my first affirmation, which is I am. I'm a walking monument to excellence. And, then, and coming out of that, then I started hearing the dialogue about, you know, people saying, you know, I can't breathe. I can't breathe, you know? And that was, you know, that's when the George Floyd kick thing kicked in. And uh, um, that from that one, I just kept going and, and writing. And that's what I'm saying, you know, instead of saying I can't breathe, I have the song, my body's a temple. I'm in perfect health when I'm like, my lungs are so strong. I blow a breeze and you start freezing. You know, I'm, I'm literally rejecting any thoughts that could permeate my psyche 
that are hitting me with negativity. And I just kept going with that and going with that and going with that. And then it became a lot of songs. And I kept adding a new song every day. I'm getting up like three, four in the morning, uh, you know, go to the studio in my house. If I'm right where I am now, start recording. And I just kept coming up with more and more ideas until there was 12 of them. Man, I think it's, uh, you know, I think there's some positive things that have come out of 2020. And I think that a lot of people have been going through different uh, reflections on their life and who they are. Away yeah. from just this album, what else have you taken away from 2020? Wow. Um, it just made you, for me, it made me aware of, um, you know, how important family, friends are and, and, and staying connected. Uh, it, it's, it, it, it kind of hits me hard that I can't, you know, go to New York and fly out of New York and see my family in New York. Um, I haven't been able to do that. So uh, that, that's been a big takeaway of how, how, how important my family and friends are to me and how, how we feed off each other and how much we need each other. Uh, that's been a big takeaway from, the, from this year. Uh, another big takeaway is to just resist, to continue to resist. Um, again, I go back to the George Floyd thing where, you know, here at one point, you know, you know, we're getting these notices and the government is saying everybody stay home. So, you know, you gotta stay home. So now you can't hit your usual spots, go to the movies, go to the park, you know, or whatever things that you normally do. You can't do those things anymore. And it's like, but the alternative entertainment is watching, you know, this black man getting killed like two or 300 times in your phone, you know, or, or whatever. You just scrolling and watching and watching it again. And so another takeaway I got from it was that, you know, to walk away from the social media formats, um, that once you see something once on the news that you already saw it, you don't have to see it a hundred times in order to uh, bring the point home and, uh, uh, and to continuously think about, uh, you know, distancing yourself from that. The other one is during that time, I connected with a woman named Dr. Alfie, who has a, uh, a group called the Acoma Project. And uh, their focus is on African American uh, mental health for the youth. And uh, so I connected with her. Uh, we came, we've started working on a handbook to address the issues co collectively of, you know, what to do about these emotions that people are feeling. Um, there's a mental health crisis that we're in the middle of right now that's going to get worse. We got a really challenge coming up in the fall because those crises usually kick up during the holidays. And so another takeaway I got from that was to become involved with this mental health organization to, uh, to help out and to spread the word on mental health awareness and destigmatize that, you know, if people need help, they should get help now. Yeah. One of the songs that uh, was, I believe it was a later addition to the project that right. is one of the ones that I have, I, re I replay most often is I'm So Successful. Right. And uh, I love the, it sounds like bongo drums. I'm, is, right. Is that, is that fair? Is that, That's yeah. Fair. Right. <laughs> you have a line on there that said, uh, even Jesus said, I was resurrected. He wouldn't yeah. have gotten on that cross without protection. Right. <laughs> what, what did you mean by that for people who might be, be curious? Well, uh, the album is about affirmations. Uh, essentially, it's about affirmations. It's about making these statements to program. The, the human consciousness and the human psyche is highly programmable. It's highly programmable. If you tell yourself, athletes do it all the time. I have a friend who was talking to me about, you know, watching Serena train uh, on the tennis court and how she's always projecting her next shot and what's going to happen next. Uh, I, I remember watching the Tiger Woods movie where uh, there's the scenes in the Tiger Woods movie where he has a headset on and on the headset, it's just telling him he's this, he's great, he's this. It's boosting up his uh, subconscious and his psyche. And so in, in this record album, it's like a lot of affirmations that people could say whether it be you are elegant, I am powerful, in order to be able to boost their psyche. So the Jesus line is actually referring to that that was the affirmation that, you know, he's, what he, before he died, he's already saying, I am resurrected, you know what I mean? Which is an affirmation in itself. And that's why well, most likely or possibly if we could put our you know, thought process to his, that he was comfortable with getting off on the cross because he knew he was coming back. <laughs> Otherwise, if he was almighty powerful and he knew that was the end, he wouldn't have got up there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Very true. You know, I think, uh, I don't know if I've heard a Mark Batson album 
Well, I don't know if I've heard of Mark Benson album, actually, but I also don't have this many tracks of you rhyming and delivering the vocals. Right. Uh, was this a new experience in, in that regard for you, or is this something that you've just been keeping in the cut? I, I was born in hip hop. So, you know, I'm, I'm from Bushwood Projects, and I was born into the beginning of hip hop. So I started out, you know, listening to hip hop tapes, the original, you know, rappers, Cold Crush Brothers, Romantic Fantastic Five, you know, uh, Double Trouble. Uh, those were my vibes. And I, I grew up, you know, going to jams, block party jams and jams in the projects, jams in Harlem, where hip hop was first being born. So I was in a rap group with my brother when I was 13 years old. So, you know, we rap, we went around to different places to battle in our early teens. Uh, um, um, we became rappers, we rap in, in, in big stage, we rap, it was an organization called the Black Rock Coalition in New York. Uh, we used to rap for, uh, for their big shows with their big bands and rock bands. And then we had a, a group called Get Set VOP that was signed to Polydor Records. And uh, we came out with our first album on that company. And at that time, I, you know, I didn't understand the business. I was just, you know, kind of coming out of college and not understanding, you know, how to market and promote. Uh, so we had, you know, some difficulties getting the record launched. And from that point, I just began to help other people, you know, with their things, help other people with their things, because I learned a lot of the mistakes. So I, I kind of don't rap uh, myself per se, you know, as an artist, but I do have my records I rap in the house. And, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm a student of the, of the culture, you know, literally sitting next to the all time greats, you know, coming to New York and uh, coming to LA and sit at the right hand of Dr. Dre, you know what I mean? <laughs> so uh, I, get, I get to see the best that work. So I'm, I'm a stu student of the art form and been a student of the art form since I was a teenager. So I have a lot of records that I'm per se play in my house, but there, seemed, there's no, there were no place for them. I, I felt like listening to rap music, I, was, I never wanted to come out with an album because I felt like in order to, to you know, come out with music, it has to be doing something for the culture or doing something for other people. And I didn't feel like there was any need for me to rap. You know, you, you have a gazillion rappers and, 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 and they, they're rapping about various topics and various beats. So I just more, more or less just helped them grow, whether it be rappers like Eminem in the past or, or 50 Cent in the past, or whether it be Tank in the, from Tank and the Bangers or Chica. Now, well, I'm just there to support um, in this particular instance, as an elder statesman of the hip hop culture, I felt it was a, it was the man that I had to do this, that I had to let my voice be heard. I had to alter, uh, offer an alternative um, to boost up every people's psyche. I had to, I had to uh, do that for myself, and and then when I shared it, you know, with some rappers who I really respect, you know, namely you know Philly Swain and uh, uh, and Bishop Lamont. Um, they both were like, yo, like, people need to hear this. And then, you know, I shared it with you, and then I shared it with Rosina, and then, you know, my partner, and then I shared it with some family members, and everybody was like, you know what, this, this could be real healing, like, this needs to be heard. And it's the first time, you know, in, in, you know, in whatever years as my uh, been in the business that I felt that that was imperative. And then after I, I you know, kind of get, got into a groove with that, then it was also like, okay, I'm going to bring notice to these mental health charities as well, uh, because uh, next week, you know, I don't, I'm not announcing that to next week, but uh, every record sold, all the all the money from it, uh, I'm just giving it to the Coma Project. It's it's not really a like a financial thing for me to make rap records. It's more like uh, it's kind of like in my in my heart, I can't say it because like legally you can't use the word fundraiser and attach to this and that. So I can't use the words, but basically I'm giving the money away. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, 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 it's, 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 uh, it's, it's some, some value with that as well. But just overall, what I'm saying is that I never felt that my voice needed to be heard on a record till right now uh, in, in years. I'm hearing a lot of records coming out of the pandemic but I'm hearing like angry records. I'm hearing struggle records. I'm hearing I can't breathe records. I'm hearing like, you know, I'm hearing that, but I'm not really hearing anybody affirm that we're more powerful than anything that's going on. You know, that we've been more powerful, that as black people, we culturally, that we're cultural giants, that 
we we rule we rule the world culturally and energy wise, and that's more important than any physical domination of the world. Like, who would you rather be? You know what I mean? Would you rather be Trump? You know, or would you rather be, you know, Jay Z or LeBron? <laughs> I mean, if you had the choice, I'm going to go with the cultural, cool, essential, powerful. That's another level of power, and and, and I just wanted to express that power and let people know that that's available at a time where we were feeling overwhelmed uh, and powerlessness. I'm watching George Floyd get killed, watching Ahmed Arbery get killed. It's like my dialogue through that whole time was like, people don't show people get killed on TV because it's too insensitive. People don't show dogs or cats get killed on television. It's too insensitive to show that. So how is it not too insensitive to show this man screaming for his mother with a you know with this man choking him with his knee on his neck acting like it's no big deal with his hands in his pockets so that from that energy and it's like what what can you do about that it's a feeling of powerlessness from that so that i wanted to express to people you know i am powerful and and that's why i made that song and then talk about culturally why we are powerful that we created these arts and sciences that we are the backbone of these arts and sciences you know from you know, West African culture, Nubian culture, you know, from the from the pyramids that we built in Sudan. There's, there's more pyramids in Sudan than there are in Egypt. So when people start, try to uh, culturally uh, say, well, maybe the Egyptians were not Africans, which is obviously it's in, it's in Africa, uh, uh, but you know, there's more pyramids in Sudan actually. So there's this big cultural thing that's going on with our people, which has been going on for thousands and thousands of years. You know, and not like, you know, America, the America that we know in, in, in American culture that we know is kind of like two lifetimes or two, only two or three lifetimes old. You know, my mom was born in the 1930s. So a hundred years before her, that's another lifetime. That's 1830. You go a hundred years before that, another lifetime before hers, that's 1730. That America didn't even exist in 1776. So this is a very young nation. This is a very young country. And our cultural links go way back further than that. Matter of fact, we, we, we're finding more information from uh, 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 anthropologists. The Africans were already here in America before. That, that, that we were uh, indigenous cultures here, were all, we were already here. That you know that 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 we're finding these big old man heads and statues like the old man head right here. You know we're finding these big statues and saying they've got these black faces on them. Like I'm just tapping into that power of our cultural heritage, our spiritual heritage, the way our spirit energy rules the planet, and then putting that into musical form. And I just felt it was absolutely needed for me to say that right now. The title track I want to see you shining. I feel like there's a lot of potential uh, 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 title tracks on this project. Why is yeah. it not called I Am Powerful, for example? Why is it not I, called, no. like, why that I, track for the album? I thought about it and, and it seemed like when it comes to that point on the record that uh, some people who don't understand affirmations or, or don't, you know, don't know what they are yet, they might listen to the album and think, you know, I'm just saying, I'm just me, I'm great, I'm the greatest, I'm the greatest of all time, I'm great, you know. They might misinterpret what the, what the message is. Uh, um, so in the song Affirmations, I describe what affirmations are. When I say, uh, uh, what you think you will become, you know, what you speak, you know, what you feel, the, the words from your tongue will describe who you will be. And, and, and I describe what it is that you know, it is. And so instead of just making this statement and standing there with, you know, making a picture of me on the top of a mountain, you know what I'm saying? The sun is shining and beaming on my chest and saying, I am powerful, like it's a, an Avengers movie. I felt like the one statement I did want to say was what I wanted for people from me by giving this away, by presenting this. And that one statement is, I want to see you shining. I probably listen to, I love working out more than anything else. <laughs> and, you know, I, I'm a, I wouldn't call myself a gym rat, but right. I was actively in the gym prior to COVID. And I went through, I guess, I, you know, I guess it's fair to call it like a dark phase, maybe a confused phase in those first couple of weeks. 
as we were adjusting to things and not being able to have that release, you know, athletically, you couldn't play basketball then. The, they, right. co- they, they closed off all the courts at that point. The gym for close makes sense. It's a Petri dish. And I felt like I lost something. And so this project helped me find my natural exercise rhythm in a different way. But I love working out, King. I love working out, King. I drop weight and break machines. <laughs> One of the hardest lines I've heard all year. <laughs> I used to make this joke, man, about uh, with Dre and them. Because, you know, uh, when I worked there, like Dre's on this super physical fitness. He, he ain't playing with that. So I used to make this joke that, you know, that they, they were so into working out that before we got to sessions, that they would come to the session about a half an hour early so they could lift their cars and park them <laughs> and lift them up. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and that's kind of where I get that from. And also from, I'm inspired by also two or three great affirmations people. Uh, one of them is, uh, first of all, it is Dre who gave me my first affirmations to say when I was going through a rough time. And then he, he, uh, he sat me down and said, take these affirmations. It was a list of affirmations and say, say these. You got to say them out loud in the mirror. At that time, I was not in a great place and I, I didn't follow through with it. But I later got familiar with uh, Louise Hay, who's a, a very a- a- affirmations that I used to listen to on YouTube. And then I got to, uh, when I want to really get to the weights, then I, I listened to C.T. Fletcher who is the most <laughs> affirmations. And that's why I get that, because he's always talking about breaking the sidewalk and cracking things. You know, C.T. <laughs> Fletcher, man, he's not playing, man. So I get that from him. But let me tell you a great story about I love working out. When I sent out the demos, uh, you know, so I wanted to see, you know, I put them on a private SoundCloud that you guys had to see which songs people liked the most. And so uh, when it got to that song, it would always be a big dip in listeners. <laughs> because... <laughs> That's, uh, that's what it was for me, because essentially I, I'm not that working out dude. Like I'm real c- cerebral, um, you know, I get up, up you know, I just want to get up and make sounds. I was, I was not athletic, you know, I, was, I never played sports in school. Um, it's just not naturally my thing, you know what I mean? So that song was actually to convince me or to be my affirmation to start saying to myself that I love working out. And, and the way I sequenced it on the album, is I sequenced the album for it to, to be great for a 30 minute workout, whether it be, a, it was for me, it's on my treadmill. And then, so when I get to that song, that's kind of that first point in my workout where I'm feeling like, you know what I mean? Like uh, when, when you start facing, I start turning things up higher, uh, turning my, my, um, my, my resistance up higher, turning my uh, uh, incline up higher. And then when that song comes on, then that helps push me through. Because then I'm saying out loud, you know, I love working out, you know, so excited to, and then sometimes even right now, and I think it's a great thing about music is that, you know, when you hear a song and you get those lyrics, they kind of like bounce around in your head subconsciously. And then sometimes, you know, it might be, I might not feel like making it to the gym. Um, and I might, you know, might not, but in my mind, I'm saying, I'm, I'm so excited to make it to the gym. I can hear that lyric in my head, uh, talking to me and, uh, and pushing me and egging me on the, uh, to make it to the gym. You know, you mentioned uh, uh, Dr. Dre working out, I guess, before, when you, when you guys were working together and recording. It stands out in my mind how brolic everybody seemed to get that was around that camp, though. Like, Dre got brolic, Busta Rhymes got brolic, Bishop Lamont got brolic. I think Eminem got the most brolic I'd ever seen him at that Bro- point in time. Right now. Brolic right now. <laughs> <laughs> right. Was that, I mean, I, and I guess that feeds into the whole detox title you know, since there was such a weed connotation with his first two projects, but it seems like yeah. that was a cultural thing. As it, it's a cultural thing. I mean, uh, you know, he, well, he has this, you know, one of the things he once told me is an expression, you know, that everything's better with exercise, you know? Mm-hmm. So, you know, when, when you work out, you, you're going to be better in the studio, you know, you're going to be, you know, better at everything you do. And um, his dedication to it, way past mine, way past mine, you know? I, it's just, again, like I said, it's, it's never been my first thing. I'm reprogramming myself now through music to get there. And I've worked out more this year than I have in years, you know? So, uh, especially with using this music as uh, pr- propelling me forward. But for him, it's, it's a daily discipline, you know, a daily discipline. Like, they, you know, he, he, they're not playing with that. You know, everything is like precision, precision diet, precision workout. Everything is on the athlete level. 
And I think that kind of permeates to the, the, you know, the whole unit, especially the artists that are signed because, you know, they have to be at their peak condition. You know, you gotta, you represent in the, the brand, uh, um, you know, whether it be 50, whether it be game, whether it be M, you know, even now I'm saying Snoop, you know, doing karate kicks and flying through the air, doing karate kicks, you know what I'm saying? Like, and uh, it's very important, you know, we, we, we all, you know, we came from this, our youth where uh, we, it, it was always this, it started to be this contest of who can hurt themselves the most and, and, and still stand on their feet. So it's like, I could drink more than you, smoke, smoke you out, you know, and, and, and it always seemed like, you know, whoever could do that the best, it, it was a, a sign of manhood and respect. Um, but as you get older, you, you don't want to be respected for drinking the most. <laughs> right. You're, you're, you you're disrespecting your liver too much to get you, props. You know, you're like 60 and you're like, but I could smoke more blunts than everybody at 60. <laughs> you, you, you don't want to be there. You know what I mean? You right. Wanna, you want to uh, you want to find something else. So I think it, it came to a point, you know, in, in, in his life and all of our lives, we started looking at the future. You know, where, where are we going to be in the future? You know, do we, where are you going to be at 60? You know, where are you going to be at 70? And then part of that is adopting, you know, these healthy lifestyles, especially to counteract a lot of the things that we did when we were very young, you know, and also to maintain a, a youthful presence or a, a, a youthful feel about ourselves and create creatively. You know, I think it was, you know, for myself, even the idea of doing the rap things that I'm doing, um, I think being in the full workout mode, pandemic workout mode and dropping 25 pounds while it was going on was part of like adding another youthful glow or youthful sensation that made me say, okay, it's all right for me to get on them, turn the mic on, you know what I'm saying? Let, 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 let me see what I can do. You know what I mean? It, it added to the energy of that and it and, and, and boosted my confidence uh, to, to follow through. What would you say it was your approach sonically? to this because there's a range of different types of production beats strings keys i mean it's it's beautifully composed uh, were you thinking about the connection between sound and mood and energy um as you're putting this together scientifically um there's there's a frequency called it's 528 hertz and uh that's like you know a, a divine frequency a love frequency a power universe frequency so I started out by tucking that frequency into the tracks as a as, as an extra boost of energy. Uh, um, uh, it's it's scientifically, you know, you know, people want to study it. Just look up five two eight H Z, and 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 look at it. I start the album literally vibrating that tone of five twenty eight H Z pure, and, and while I'm talking, and uh, that was the vibe. As far as the music is concerned, when I first started to craft the album, right before listening to that. I was listening to uh, a Love Supreme, Coltrane, when, when the pandemic started. And I was also listening to Pharrell Sanders, Creator, had a mass, Creator Has a Master Plan. And I thought about those kind of modal uh, frequency beds that you know, these great soloists would come up to and then how they drop their lyrics on top of it. So you, know, you get like Coltrane, that whole Love Supreme vibe where it's just like this modal thing, this really simple modal thing, the Love Supreme. The love, and then all of a sudden he comes in, he's melodically, whatever, doing the thing and flowing to it and creating these beautiful melodies to elevate it. And uh, that's kind of where I started with the I am uh, a piece. It's just like this one kind of modal frequency, these three chords. I add the 528 hertz to it. And then there's a part of the record that you know, stripped away from all of the extra sonics. There's a acoustic bass and a piano, kind of like a piano trio vibe pulling on the Herbie Hancock's and the Chick Corea kind of vibe. And, I, and, and, and then so I'm going into these solos. It did pull from a lot of 70s, uh, um, 70s alternative free jazz, uh, weather report, you know, uh, like Joe Zawano, Chick, Herbie. That's kind of like the vibe I'm going with with the keyboard. So I got this piano trio and then I'm kind of layering it on top. And I wanted to craft the entire album just like what it would be if it was a performance. So in that performance, it's literally like a jazz trio playing uh, um, in, in, in these kind of modal 70s uh, context. 
and then these layers of synthesizers and all that on top of it, building on top of it. And, and I wanted to stay with those sonics throughout. So I would break off here and there. I didn't want to rely on beats to, to tell the story because I felt like for me doing it, I would be invading the space of people who work, who rhyme to beats all the time. So if I'm just dropping, I didn't want to just drop a record because I, I make beats and drums and all, that's my thing. But I wanted it to just be, it's my voice to these interesting piano and sounds and synthesizers and things that were um, familiar to me on a personal level. Um, I once heard uh, Pharrell say that if your music sounds like somebody else's music, uh, then you should get out the way because you're in their lane, you know? And I've always admired him for having the sounds that nobody else music sounded like Pharrell. You know, when he was at the height of making Pharrell records, everybody knew when Pharrell dropped, he had his own drums, he had his own sounds, he had his own Neptunes, everything is Pharrell. And, and Chad, they had their Neptune sound. So for me, I took the elements to, and began to craft what I felt was the sound I would make that was important to me. So I didn't lean on any trap drums, any, you know, vocals turned backwards and forwards, any muted pianos or all the things that are on hip hop records today. It was more like, this is what I sound like. And, and, I'm, and I'm comfortable enough with saying, you know, okay, I'm not looking to com compete with the baby and Roddy Rich. That's what they do. You know, that's the music for the kids. You know, I'm looking to do what I do and then present it to people and say, this is a whole different lane of where I am, if you want to experience, you know, what, what, where, where I am and what I make for me. The album uh, reached number one on the iTunes New Age charts. Yes. Uh, I don't know if I have another New Age hip hop album that I can reference off top. It's the first uh, of the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was that it? So was that intentional to like approach New Age? I mean, again, like I say, uh, like you described earlier, it sounded like this was a really organic process. Uh, but I we think had it does take, yeah, but it does take a lot of strategy to figure out where you want to place your project once it's available. The I'll story be... of how we got there is so great. <laughs> <laughs> I sat down at, at, at the end and then, you know, I talked and then we talked to my team and uh, Rosina, uh, Didro Hara, my manager, uh, Charlene Vaughn who came in to do marketing. And then uh, uh, I was sitting down there talking and uh, I was looking over charts to say, oh, where, where does this record belong? Because it's different than anything. I don't want to say, okay, let's, take, let's get a single and go for Spotify so they can play it after Cardi B. That's, that's for that generation. I, I didn't want to say that. So I looked over the charts and I was starting to look at the names of the artists who were on the charts. And then I saw this new age long chart and it was talking about, you know, it had a bunch of records. I looked over each one and, and it, I saw the jazz chart and it had like a lot of cool records in jazz. And I was like, maybe, maybe it sounds like jazz. Maybe when we go after, maybe we present it as jazz. But then when I saw the new age list, uh, it's, it had uh, Deepak Chopra on it and the Dalai Lama. I said, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be on the chart with Deepak Chopra <laughs> and the Dalai Lama on it. <laughs> and that's, that's why we so. decided to do that. <laughs> that is awesome. Um, when's the last time you were stressed out? When's the last time you felt, you know, tight? That's yesterday, you know, something happened and got on my nerves. I snapped on somebody a little bit. I apologized. I mean, every, we all have good and bad days. Uh, the, rec and the, the beauty of my record and why I call it King Batson and uh, people was like, why does it say on the record, King Batson produced by Mark Batson? And, uh, and, 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 and why do you look a little different on the cover? I said, this King Batson is the best version of myself. That's, I'm projecting to, to, to be that person. Uh, I'm not there yet. I have days where I get close. Um, but you know, when people see me and they might be like, damn, you got the song, I, I love working out. They, they walk in the room, they might expect me to look like Schwarzenegger. But you know, in the reality, I don't. You know, I'm somebody who, it uh, needs to lose 25, 30 more pounds this year. And, and it's using this music to get me better, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to amplify where I am. And so uh, at the end of the day, um, uh, the whole King Batson project 
is for me to, to say to other people, can you find your royal self? That we all have a royal nature to ourselves. And, and if we look at our lives really honestly, uh, in comparison to 100 years ago, I'm royalty compared to how my ancestors lived. Uh, uh, we, we, we have indoor plumbing. That was 150 years ago. That was only for the top royalty in the world. And as far as changing the temperature of your home and, 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 and when it's hot and making it cold, you know what I mean? Like nobody could do that. You, you had to have like 20 people standing in front of you with fans uh, uh, to, to achieve these things. So it is about finding your royal self and, 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 and projecting that. And so, and, you know, at the end of the day, this is something I'm working on myself. Uh, I'm, I'm working on finding these things myself. I'm looking for the perfect me. I'm looking, I'm talking to myself in those songs. And even when it breaks down to the I want to see you shining, I'm still talking to me in the mirror. I listen to the songs of the mirror. I highly recommend, my treadmill is in front of a mirror. And that's great. But I highly recommend listening to a mirror, in front of a mirror, go to your bathroom, look in the mirror, the elegant song, you know, mirror work. It describes what mirror work is. You know, it works, you know, Take off your shirt, tell yourself that you're perfect and just keep building and going forward from there. So I'm searching for that myself. And, uh, and, and I'm hoping that as time progresses that I can use this music and other music I'm writing to get me closer.